Welcome to Coffee with the Curator. Uh, my name is Sarah Cohn. I am the Associate Curator here at the Berlin Institute of Arts. Uh, today, myself and Rachel Holstag will be giving a kind of behind-the-scenes tour of sons um, seeing the modern, modern African-American male. Now, this is a little different than most of the Coffee with the Curators that we've done thus far, because instead of kind of taking a deep dive into a theme, or uh, a time period of, of artwork in the exhibition, we're going to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes uh, look into kind of how exhibitions are formed and what we do as curators uh, under the umbrella of the current Hodge Henry exhibition. And um, in our, in our write-up for this, we said that we would end with a tour in the galleries. Now, we've had some really large crowds for coming with the curator. So um, with that in mind and uh, COVID you know, issues in mind, we're going to present most of everything in this space. And then afterwards, we'll be in the gallery for a little while if you want to come in and we can you know, talk about things and do a little mini tour. But we thought it might be good to really let everybody spread out, drink your coffee, and, and have um, the wonderful goodies from Big B. Uh, thanks, Big B, for being a sponsor for this um, series of talks. So I want to go ahead and get started, but before we jump into Suns, let's see what's coming up next. So next month, we are going to have uh, our copy with the curator is called Portrait of a Queen. And this will be presented by our curator of collections and exhibitions, Tracy Glad, which I know you've all heard Tracy talk many times. This will be a really fascinating talk. So March 14th at 10.30 a.m., same as same time, same place, uh, we'll be covering Portrait of a Queen. So when we think about exhibitions, uh, there's a lot of things that come to mind. And I will break down kind of the, the trail from beginning to end. But before we do that, I want to give you an overview of the concept of this exhibition because it's, it's a really interesting concept of uh, exercise to do. If you haven't been into the gallery already, I highly encourage you to go through kind of with the artist intent in mind. So on the screen, you see a face and a quote that says, who do you see when you look at me? So this exhibition is a black and white and color photographs by artist Jerry Taldero. Now we've had Jerry in the exhibition space before, which we'll get into in a moment. But this particular project um, and exhibition really encourages an examination of how African American, African American males are perceived by others and how that is kind of opposed to how they see themselves. So the exhibition layout is actually two parts. So the very first part is this section called What Do You See When You Look At Me? The exhibition layout is intended to be reminiscent of a real-life encounter with a stranger. So when you meet with a stranger, you don't know really a whole lot about them. That's why they're a stranger to you. Um, so when you see a stranger, your brain often makes very quick assessments. Uh, these assessments can lead to assumptions. And assumptions you know, about who this person is, based on how they look, how they carry themselves, what they're wearing, all of those things, our brain kind of instantly creates a story of who this individual might be. Uh, we can come to hundreds of conclusions based on just uh, physical appearance and what we kind of know about, you know, generally know about people. So Talifero really wanted to challenge assumptions because sometimes those can lead to really negative outcomes. And in this case, especially for African American men. So, the first section, you are introduced only to the man's face. There is no identifying information. It is just a black and white photograph of their faces. And you'll see some installation shots in just a moment. There is a prompt on the wall that says, what do you see when you look at me? So with no bio biographical information, you are prompted to consider each man based on their facial features, their expressions, and their hairstyle. There's really nothing else that you can kind of make connections to. So this is an integral part of the concept of the show, because you are entering into the space knowing nothing about who these men are. And with that question on the, on the title wall that says, what do you see when you look at me? It really, Talifero wants you to start to think about 
what would you see? What do you, how do you assess each one of these individuals? What do you think about them? Um, and then, in the second section, you are introduced to significantly more information. So you have the ability at that point to kind of rethink maybe your initial perceptions. So the second section is called I Am. It introduces you to each participant in a much deeper way. Visitors are presented with very large scale color photographs. Um, in the first section, there's small black and white photographs. So these large photographs are showcasing much more about each individual's personality. So during the photo shoot, Talavera really asked for every single man to come dressed as they want to, um, whether it's their work attire or their casual clothing or uniforms, whatever it is that really showcases who they are. So he said, come dressed in, in, in clothing that represents you. Bring props, you know, anything that indicates who you are as a person. You'll walk through the exhibition and you'll see things like musical instruments. You'll see artwork. You'll see uh, books that, that they've read or written. Uh, we have at least one author in that space. And so these attributes and the clothing and the poses really, on the surface level, get you to know these men a little bit more. And so that's a, the next step in kind of breaking through that barrier of being introduced to a stranger. We take it one step further in the exhibition with information that accompanies each, accompanies each whole, uh, photo. So there is a label next to the photograph that includes the man's name, uh, three attributes chosen by him. So you'll see examples of that as we progress through the slides. And a biography that was information provided either by the person who nominated each participant or the man themselves. You know, they gave us a lot of info about themselves. And the other key component, and I always encourage everyone to take advantage of this, is there are QR codes on the labels. And those will bring up videos that were created by Jerry Talaferro and the participant. During the photo shoot, he asked them a series of questions. And this element of the exhibition is really kind of getting into some of the struggles that these men have had throughout their lives, but also some of the um, hopes and dreams and wonderful moments of their lives. So when you look at the images in the second section, and you read the biographies, and you watch the videos, you now know a lot more about these participants than you did in the beginning of the exhibition. And that's really what Talaferro was interested in with this show. Um, I have, before we move on, I wanted to, to give you a quote about kind of how Jerry perceives the idea of this. He said, I believe that much of the fear and mistrust that we experience in our relationships may be attributed to fear of the unknown. <clears throat> As a black American male, I have seized the discomfort of others, I've, I've sensed the discomfort of others and myself in certain encounters. I've also been amazed at how the discomfort dissipates as we learn more about one another and discover the many things we have in common. This simple exhibition is a humble attempt to dispel some of the fear and discomfort. I hope that this exhibition will be a catalyst for conversation and increased understanding. Now, that's the basic idea of the show. Now, how does something like that travel to the Flynn Institute of Arts? In order to have this discussion, we're going to kind of rewind back to 2017. In January of 2017, the Flynn Institute of Arts had an exhibition titled Women of a New Crowd. We've got a wonderful timeline that you can kind of see all of the key points in the development of this of the show. <clears throat> so in 2017, Women of New Tribe debuted in the Hodge and Henry Galleries. These photographs were also taken by Jerry Calcaro. <coughs> Dry in January, that is for sure. And humidifier. Um, sorry about that. In January of 2017, this show was a really spectacular moment for the history of the FIA. We had uh, Jerry Talaferro, 
um, come to the Flint Institute of Arts and photograph 49 women from the Flint community. The exhibition was created to celebrate the accomplishments and the inner and outer beauty of local women. It featured 49 large-scale black and white photographs. The participants were nominated by the community, and the nominators were asked to consider women who had a positive impact on individuals or on the community as a whole. The exhibition was a success. The photographs became part of the museum's permanent collection, um, and they have since been displayed in a number of places in the museum. So we've worked with Jerry in the past, and it was this wonderful experience that was a really fantastic celebration. So when we started to think about future exhibitions, we really started to consider one of the other exhibitions that he had created. So in January of 2020, the photographs, uh, Women of New Tribe photographs were installed in the museum's lobby. And you can see this uh, installation shot, basically floor to ceiling, covered almost that entire large wall out there. So they were, they were well received again by the public. And at this point, we really started to think about bringing Jerry back because he had proposed this exhibition called Sons, uh, Seeing the Modern African American Male to Us. And we thought, you know, we really love what you did with Women of New Tribe. Let's revisit this conversation. So that's one of the ways that we start developing exhibitions at the museum. Um, a lot of what we do as curators is seeking out exhibitions that are temporary to really show the community what we have um, in, our, in our collection, but also what's out there in the larger art world. So exhibitions develop in a number of ways. Sometimes they're curated from objects from our collection, if you go down the decorative arts hallway currently, you'll see a show called Restrained Unrestrained. All of those objects are from the museum's permanent collection, and they're curated and we've researched to kind of fit a theme. Uh, we also get exhibitions from other institutions or collectors or galleries, or in this case, working directly with an artist. So we think about all of these things. It's our job to consider all of the options and to find out what is best for the Flint Institute of Arts and the community. Because Women of the New Tribe was such a success, we were really intrigued by the concept of sons. Um, without going into an incredible amount of detail about exactly how exhibition proposals start to when they're finished, um, we'll go into a decent amount of detail, but not every little facet. But basically what happens, once we determine some ideas for exhibitions, they end up going to a committee for approval called the Exhibitions Committee. And uh, they will approve or you know, discuss potential exhibitions. And with their approval, the exhibition then goes out to the board for their approval. So there's a series of groups that approve these exhibitions. Now, when we presented SUDS, it was all an uproarious yes. It was instantaneous almost, because the committee really saw how important Women of New Tribe was to the exhibition space and to the FIA. And so we had the exhibition approved, and then we began the nomination process. So the nomination process started with the Community Gala in January of 2021. Uh, the gala was virtual in 2021, and Jerry Talaferro and the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions, Tracy Glaub, presented the concept for SUNS and opened up the nomination forms. And so what we ended up with is a digital, um, and actually we have digital and physical submissions. So what we were looking for was very similar to Women of the New Tribe. We used the same nomination process and we asked similar questions. Um, has the person had a positive impact on individuals? Have they helped those around them in the neighborhood? Or have they created positive change or furthered important issues in the community? So we publicly posted this everywhere that we could, and we got a large amount of responses. So if someone in the community knew an African-American male who exhibited at least one of the three of these, 
they have the opportunity to uh, nominate them for the exhibition to become participants. So 164 nominations were sent in. We had multiples, some people were nominated five or six times, and what we ended up with was 120 individual um, men. So what we discovered, and Rachel will get into how this happened, we had space for 50. And so what we needed to do was to figure out how these, uh, these individuals would be selected. And we did the same thing we did with Women of the New Tribe. Basically, it was anonymous uh, pulling names from a, from a hat, not literally, but you know, we, we gave everyone an equal shot and we pulled uh, the names from a box and we ended up with 50 participants or space for 50 people. I'm going to introduce now Rachel Jose, who is our assistant curator. Um, she's integral in all of our exhibitions. And um, she's going to discuss a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of how the exhibition came to be in terms of its physical element, how it was built. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, she said, I'm Rachel. So, what Sarah said, we're going to talk about sort of the nuts and bolts of the exhibition. So, Part of the great thing about working with Jerry is that he wanted each venue that hosted the Sun's exhibition um, to put their own spin on it so that each experience was different. Um, and at this point, I believe that there have been five or six other venues who have hosted the Sun's exhibition. So one of the things that we got to decide here at the FIA was what size we wanted the photographs that were going to be used. And we knew from Women on the Tribe that we loved that large scale feel of them. Uh, not only are they monumental in size, but it sort of uh, elevates the person that is being depicted as well, which is something that we're trying to do with the exhibition. Um, so to come up with the frame size for this, uh, I went to the drawing board, literally. Um, I use a 3D modeling program called SketchUp to create digital layouts of our exhibition space. Um, and we use this for a lot of exhibitions as a really good starting off point. Um, so we knew for the exhibition, because it has this two-part component, uh, the first I am, or the first who you see when you look at me, and the second I am, we knew we wanted to separate Red Gallery into two separate spaces. So right off the bat, we knew that we wanted to construct a wall here, or extend the wall, uh, so that we have this first section for the who you see when you look at me, and the second for the I am. So we knew that, but we didn't know what size frame to be on. And because this was different from Women of the Tribe, and there was this extra component, we had to factor that in. So the first space, if you haven't been into the gallery, the first space here holds the black and white photograph, and then the rest of the gallery holds the color photographs. Um, so I went in and I played with the different frame sizes. Uh, the first on the left here, I used all of the same frame sizes as women of the tribe for both the black and white and for the color photos. And then for the second one that you see in the middle, I used all the same size as well, just on a smaller scale. And then the third one was what I kind of called a hybrid, where the black and white photographs were smaller and the color photographs were larger. So um, the first one was not right. Uh, we felt that the black and white photographs at that size would be a little too overwhelming, and we would have had to actually stack them in the gallery instead of having them straight in one line. The second one, we felt that size for both would be kind of underwhelming. So the third was just right. And so I took this to the other curators, and we quickly decided that this was going to be our plan. So we ended up with uh, the black and white photograph in this section, being 16 by 20 frames, and then the color photographs were going to be the same size as Women of the Tribe at 40 by 50 inches. And at that point, we decided that we could fit 50 comfortably in the gallery. Anything more, uh, we wouldn't be able to have a lot of breathing room, so 50 was a good number. And we ran this number by the artist and the sizes, and he agreed with uh, what we had proposed to him. And actually, uh, if you saw it in the first one, we had originally planned to have two entrances that go into the second exhibition space, 
But, um, you know, as great as these digital layouts and things like this are, you really don't get the feel of things until you're in it and you're in the gallery and moving things around. So when we actually got into the gallery, when we started installing the exhibition, we decided that one entrance into the exhibition space would really facilitate this concept of first meeting with a stranger and you really have to move through the space before getting to the second dimension. So next we're going to talk about the photo shoot. So we had the photo shoot in August of 2021, and he was, it was from August 23rd to the 30th, and Jerry Calipero came to Flint and he was photographed and videotaped the subject of the exhibition. It was a very long eight days, uh, as we had to fit in all 50 men into uh, this short period of time. And Jerry would have to, uh, did a couple of things. So he had to capture the image for the black and white photograph, for the color photograph, and then he also uh, filmed a video that he uh, produced for each subject that Sarah talked about earlier. Um, so we started at 8 a.m. We ended at 8.30 p.m. Uh, it was a very long seven, eight days. Uh, we put about seven people in each day. So what's behind me is sort of some behind the scenes footage of the photo shoot. Uh, you'll see how Jerry is interacting with the subject. Um, in this case, it's Rico Phillips. And he really, he wants them to be very comfortable. So he gives them direction, but also wants their input. You can see that Rico's going behind the camera, see what Jerry's doing. Jerry's giving him some tips on, you know, how to hold his uh, hockey stick and things like that. Um, and it was really, from what we heard, a great experience uh, for the men for this photo shoot. Uh, getting to highlight their achievements, uh, but then also to work with Jerry, uh, who is a very interesting person and a great person to come to. Um, <clears throat> so we just have Rico there, and his photograph, and those were his final photographs. So, we're back to our timeline, uh, and with the photo shoot wrapped up, the next step was to finalize what photographs would be used in the exhibition from what Jerry kept on the list. There were hundreds to choose from for each man, um, and like I said, we had to have these two different photographs for the exhibition that we had to choose from. So, the artists actually gave the men the opportunity to choose the color photograph that they wanted to use in the IAM section. Um, so, to do this and to keep the photographs confidential, what we did was we had Jerry pre-select uh, between 8 and 10 photographs that he liked. And then we printed them off on contact sheets like this, we sealed them in an envelope, and the men actually uh, had to come to the museum for a short period of time and look through the photographs, and then we had them initial, you can see where the mark is initialed, on the one that they wanted chosen for the exhibit. So it was another great addition to the exhibition in the sense that the men really got to choose how they wanted to be represented. And then not all men chose uh, the photographs that they wanted to use. They had the option to have Jerry select the photos and about half chose that. All right. So we're back to our timeline and next we're going to talk about the catalog. So, um, Another component to this exhibition was the exhibition catalog. Uh, just in the last 10 years, the FIA has produced 12 catalogs of the exhibitions uh, that we have on view here. And the catalog is a way, great way to supplement the exhibition and serves as a souvenir, um, especially for an exhibition like this for the men that were involved. Um, so typically for a catalog, we, we hire someone to design it, but um, I have an interest in graphic design, and I was given the opportunity to actually design the catalog myself. So we're going to talk about um, how I came up with the layout a little bit, and what you can find. So just like the exhibition, we had to have a layout for this, um, and this was my starting point, just to keep myself organized on uh, how the book was going to come out. Uh, the book started would start with a note from our director, in our, an artist statement from Jerry, and then an essay that Sarah and I co-wrote. 
So like the exhibition, the book is split up into two sections. The first section, you can see when you look at me, you're prompted with that question, and then you'll see all 49 black and white images of the men. And then you get to the second section, the I am, and again, you are prompted with the 49 black and white images, or the 49 color images of the men. And then underneath, we have those attributes that Sarah was talking about earlier, uh, that the men actually got to chose, choose for themselves. So Anthony chose man of the community, entrepreneur, and volunteer. And so here you can see a side-by-side -side view of Anthony's two pages. And so in order to allow you to flip back and forth between the two uh, sets of photographs, you have this up here in the corner. Uh, it says perception 15-reality 67. And those serve as the page numbers. So Anthony's uh, perceived image from the first section, in black and white, is on page 15. If you want to find his color photograph, you flip to page 67, and you can see that. And then it's just the opposite for the um, color photograph. And if uh, you're interested in the exhibition catalog, there is one in the exhibition right now. You can also purchase it at our museum. Okay, so we're back to our timeline, and now we're actually going to talk about how we installed the exhibition and how it went from this to this in 15 days. 15 days. Mm -hmm. So, with our exhibition, um, we really we don't want the galleries closed for too long uh, because we want visitors to be able to see what we have. So we have a very limited time period to get a lot of things done. Uh, for our graphics gallery, we have a one-week flip in between the last exhibition and the next one. For the Hodge and Henry Galleries and Harris and the Decorative Arts Gallery, we have three weeks. And then for the Harris Burger Gallery, we have four weeks. So one of the ways we stay organized is through work orders. Uh, here's just an example from Sons. And actually, in this case, we had not only the Hodge and Henry exhibition going on, but we also had uh, the graphics exhibition that we're working at the same time. So this was a really great way to keep our staff, as well as the facility staff, who were working hand in hand with through the entirety of the installation. And we don't always follow the schedule. You know, things happen, but it really helps us uh, keep on track. So uh, the, the previous exhibition was Brush with Reality, Dollar and Scary, and that closed on January 2nd. You can see the installation shot on the left. And then by Tuesday afternoon, you see what the gallery looks like on the right. Um, we had to go in, uh, our collections manager uh, condition reported each of the um, photo, the paintings of a series, and then we packed them up and sent them back to their right home. So they were able to get that done very quickly. And then you can see here, this wall is actually this wall. And if you didn't notice about the Hodge and Henry galleries, is that these walls are movable, and so we can move them around. That will help us create sort of an endless amount of layouts. So the next step was for our facilities department to create that wall that we talked about that goes into the next space. So there's an image of them constructing it. And then we had to choose a paint color. So there's not just one black paint. Uh, and similar to when you're painting your house, you really want to get a color that will accentuate the artwork that's going to be in there. So we had three different blacks that we looked at. Then we had a contractor come in and they painted the space for us. And then we started on our layout. So um, we wanted to have equal space in between all of the photographs, so there was a lot of math involved trying to get the, uh, the exact amount of spacing. And you can see we will have the photographs on the ground there, and we move them around to get our exact spot. And there's the other section of the gallery that we can do doing our layout. And then once everything was laid out, uh, the facility staff hung the photographs, and then we had a contractor come in, and she applied the vinyl for us. And now Sarah is going to just talk about our school preview and the last couple of things. Okay. 
okay, so here we have a quick snapshot of the oh, here it is. A quick snapshot of both of the dimensions, which as you enter into the gallery, of course, you'll see. Um, but side by side, it's a really interesting juxtaposition. You've got the small images with no information uh, versus the bright white gallery with these um, over life size, in most cases, uh, color photographs. And they're very fantastic. Now, we we usually have the opening of our January exhibition is coupled with the community gala. So there's this big celebration uh, opening night. However, the gala has been postponed, which I'll give you dates for that uh, at the end of the presentation. But we really wanted to make the night before the opening to the public special to all the participants. So we invited every participant and a guest to come see their photos before anybody else other than staff had the opportunity to check out the exhibition. So I just have a couple of photographs of that night. And you can see uh, the gentleman in the red is Albert Rock, who was actually one of the participants. And uh, he's pointing to some people that he recognizes. And this is where they really got to experience the videos for the first time. So you see another photograph here of the videos that come up from the QR codes um, in action. So it was a really wonderful event. Unfortunately, Jerry couldn't make it back for the participant preview, but we had him zoomed in on the screen in the little uh, theater there. So participants were able to chat with Jerry He'll be back um, to celebrate during the gala in April. Now, the QR code is a great way to access each individual video. But I wanted to tell you of an alternative way. So if you want to watch all of the videos at home, this is a really great way to do it. So this is what you'll see in the exhibition space. Uh, we've got a name, we've got our three attributes of uh, bio information, the black and white photograph that corresponds to the color photograph, and then the QR code. So you scan it with your cell phone, it should bring up um, our audio guide website. But there's another way to access that, which is just on our homepage. So if you've never used our new audio guide um, system, it's relatively new, but a year old, you can access it through our homepage. And basically you go to uh, flynnarts.org and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the homepage, and there's a section that says audio guides. If you click on that, it will bring up every gallery of the museum and every audio guide in those galleries. What we've done is we've incorporated the videos into the audio guide section. So when the video is queued up, this is what you see. This screenshot is queued up on Leon Adams, but you can see everybody else is listed there. So if you really want to get to know each one of these men, but you're, you know, you have limited time in the gallery, each video is three to five minutes long. So 49 minutes, you're going to be standing for a while. So you can access them from your computer at home, um, or you can use the QR code. So I highly encourage that aspect of the exhibition. If you haven't walked through, or even if you have, to kind of go through again and spend some, spend some time. If you're interested in further discussions and celebrations of SUNS, we do have some upcoming or upcoming programs. March 5th at 2 p.m. in the theater, we have a community dialogue. So Matt Franklin is going to be discussing experiences uh, with uh, four participants. And it's free, open to the public. It's on Saturday. So you can come and actually hear from the participants themselves. If you're interested in hearing from Jerry, your opportunity is the Community Gala, which is on April 2nd at 6 p.m. It's um, in the theater, the lobby, the exhibition space. If you haven't been to a gala yet, there are fantastic events, the food, the music, and um, wonderful lectures. So Jerry will be doing a Q&A session with Tracy Clapp. And then the next day, uh, Sunday, April 3rd at 2 p.m., he will be in the gallery just kind of answering questions for anyone who, who wants to chat with him. It's significantly more informal than the gala. And if you've not met Jerry Talavera yet, uh, he's a fantastic uh, individual to talk to. He loves to chat. So I you know, definitely recommend coming in and visiting him while he's back in town. 
Any of any questions or anything? Yeah. Is your Delta a local artist, and if not, how did you get in touch with him for the first? Sure. He is uh, based out of North Carolina, and he, uh, I believe, he approached us for the first exhibition. So sometimes we will have artists send us proposals, and typically it's a concept for a show, checklist, that type of thing. We seek out artists who have a really thorough exhibition history, so artists who have exhibited over many different places. Um, and I believe he's the one who sent us his proposal for a show. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for coming. Uh, there's a ton of coffee, you can see the snacks back there. Um, and we will be in the gallery if anyone wants to chat. Um, we'll be in